Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead and open your Bibles to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. Uh, it's, it is a healing. You know, we're going to teach on the subject of, of healing or, or along those lines. And um, we're going to talk about tonight... Uh, Jesus being anointed. So let's look here. If you've got any prayer calls, go ahead and bring them up. And um, it would do me a lot of good if I got the right verse. There we go. I'm looking at 28 instead of 38. Let's look at Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now I understand God's not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. Amen? In other words, it doesn't matter who you are. If you'll operate faith, God will honor it. Amen? But, that may, but if you're somebody special and you don't use faith, you, he doesn't honor that. You can be the head of the Sanhedrin and don't operate in faith. God doesn't honor your position. He honors, so he's not a respecter of persons. He is a respecter of faith. Yeah. Amen? You know, faith moves God. Faith is how we uh, get, get in to position with God where he'll do what he said in his word that he would do. Amen. The just are to live by faith. Glory to God. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Amen. The word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Now we know the baptism that John preached. We know that John came preaching, you know, you, you had to be baptized. He preached that one was coming after him that was mightier than him. Amen. Whose shoes he was that were the dumb Lucy. You know, he, he, was a re, he was one crying in the wilderness. So we know John had a message of repentance, but there was one coming after him that had a, had a mightier ministry. He said, you know, I'd be baptized with water, but he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Amen. So, you know, you know Jesus, Jesus came and a different message came. Amen. And listen, here's the message. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Praise God. Everybody say praise God. Now notice, there's, there's several things here. One is, number one, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. We understand from the book of Philippians that Jesus laid aside his rights to deity and glory, walked among us as a man anointed by the Spirit. Praise God. He, he, he chose to lay aside his rights to use his deity. And, and, and the reason was, he had to fulfill the ministry of man. He had to prove that man could do what God has originally established for man to do and to do it according to the word of God and without, you know, using his deity to do it. Why? Because if he didn't, then we couldn't follow after it. If we had to be, if we had to be God to do it, then we couldn't do it. We had to be able to do it like Jesus did, a man anointed under the covenant. Amen. So he laid that aside. And so then, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you something. I, I may, some of you may have saw as a child, or, well, some of y'all have been older than a child. I was young. We were, Janie and I were uh, oh, early, I mean, you know, 20, 19, 20. Saw the Shroud of Turin. Okay? Uh, English, you know, the English translation would be the Shroud of Tor Torino. Turin is the Italian pronunciation of Torino, the city of Torino on the uh, upper northwest coast of Italy. And, uh, but the Shroud of Turin, and, you know, and of course, the, you know, the church at Rome believes they have the, the burial shroud of Jesus. And then when he was buried, you know, that, you know, his, his being and in, in, in essence burned in, into the cloth, his image, and et cetera, and et cetera, and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's, a, it's an artifact that they use as part of the, uh, with the Catholic artifacts. They always have artifacts, you know, something from some saint in some, you know, somewhere. And it makes it, uh, supposedly makes it, you know, whatever, you know, holy and makes this right, whatever. And, uh, but anyway, in that movie, um, or and it, was, it was kind of a docu docu documentary movie, um, they talk about Jesus, and they talk about historical, and where Jesus was in history, and that kind of stuff. So at 12 years old, he left his mom and dad, and went off on caravans, and traveled around the world. 
You know, he's making clay pigeons and breathing on them, and they came alive and all this kind of stuff. Now, the Bible itself tells us what Jesus did during the eight, what are referred to by many people as the 18 missing years. Is this not the carpenter? Is this not Joseph's son, the carpenter? He was building, he was building stuff, and he wasn't breathing on it, making it live. We have no record of that. that he was known as the carpenter. And you can't be out on caravans all over the world making clay pigeons come alive if you're known in your local hometown as the carpenter. You know? Oh, that's little Jesus. We hadn't seen, him in, you hadn't seen him in 18 years. No, he was the carpenter. Amen? You know, he didn't do anything ministry-wise until his time was come. Amen? Amen? Now, you do know that, you know, as, as a child, you know, we haven't been at the temple being... You know, uh, and, and the prophets, you know, the, the older people coming and saying, my eyes seen the salvation of the Lord. Then we see him again at 12 when he got left behind when they went and paid their taxes. And, you know, and, and he was argue, uh, disputing with the doctors of the law and his parents uh, came and found him. And then the next time we have Jesus is 18 years later. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> and in that 18 years when he came, he came and, you know, John the Baptist saw him coming and he came to be baptized of him. And John the Baptist says, you know, I have need to be baptized of thee. And Jesus said, suffer it or allow it to be so, for we must fulfill righteousness. And so John baptized him. When he came up out of the water, a heavenly dove came out of heaven. And John heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. Glory to God. And then Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now the Bible says he went in Luke chapter 4. says um, he went into the wilderness full of the spirit. Glory to God. And was tempted of the devil for 40 days. And after the, that, that 40 days has come, he was a hunger. Now, we do know this. You know, he fasted. He was fasting for 40 days. And one of the natural side effects of, of fasting is that when your hunger leaves, you know, you can fast. And about the, about the second, two and a half, three days into the fast, your hunger leaves. If you're fasting, you're just drinking water, your hunger will leave. And, um, but when it returns, you're on the brink of starvation. In other words, the body will come back and go, and it'll be on the brink of starvation. It will have exhausted its supply of natural fat, whatever, and it needs food. And so the brink of starvation. And so the Bible says, and afterward, he was a hungered. And so he, he was about to enter into starvation. Of course, Satan comes, and the first thing he says to him is, if you be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, it's written all, that thou shalt not live by bread alone. Amen. And he goes on through the temptations of, you know, of the kingdoms of the world, and if they take it, throw himself off the temple, and overcomes by saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. And the Bible says this at the end of that, uh, in the, there, Luke chapter 4, it says, and he returned in the power of the Spirit. Amen. And then he went into the temple, and as on the Sabbath, as his custom was, and it was handed in him the book of the, of the scroll, or the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me. He hath anointed me. Amen. See, Jesus was anointed. In his earthly ministry, he was anointed as a man walking under the covenant. Well, now, Acts 10.38 kind of gives us a synopsis of the anointing. Now, Jesus quotes Isaiah's uh, explanation of it, you know. He'll heal the broken heart and bind it. So we can declare the acceptable year of the Lord and so forth. But Acts 10 30 is really a synopsis of what Jesus said there in Luke 4. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. And healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with them. So we can find several things here. Number one, Jesus was anointed. What's he anointed with? According to, that, well, according to Isaiah 10, 27, the anointing is the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of God. But yet we find out from 1 John's epistles that the anointing is the Holy Ghost. Amen? The third person of the Godhead who came on him, and the word anoint meant to, 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 uh, to smear or to pour on. And the old covenant, when they anointed the priest, they didn't just, you know, how many, you know, if you've ever you know, seen the anointing service, you get the little, the little cross with the oil, the olive oil with frankincense in it. You know, you get the little dabble, do your deal. Amen, your Flintstones. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. In the old covenant, they just took the whole thing and put it on top of your head, just ran down their beard, ran down everything, and saturated them. Amen. I wonder if we ought to start doing that in church because people would get the real idea what the anointing's about. To get saturated. Amen? Instead of the little dabble, do you? Come on. You lighten up. They just poured it on top of your head and it just ran all the way down. Amen? I mean, just soaked them. 
Hallelujah. I heard one preacher one time said he, he went with somebody to pray for somebody and they were going to, you know, somebody was going to anoint the person with oil and that, that person pulled out the little anointing thing. He said, no, he just pulled out a thing and just dumped it on him right there in the bed. <laughs> Some people get upset with you. Well, if you get healed, who cares? We can wash the sheets. Buy new ones. Amen? Hallelujah. But how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Now, um, he goes on after that and says, with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about... Now, the, the anointing has a purpose. We said that this morning, that the, when the Holy Spirit has a purpose. He doesn't do things just to do them purposelessly. I know that's probably not a word, but you know, without purpose. There's a purpose behind the workings of God. There was a purpose behind the anointing of God on Jesus. What? So he could go do good and heal. Amen. But not only heal, notice who God's word gives credit. It's probably not the right word, but uh, blames. God, God, look who's God's word, where, where God's word puts the blame on who makes people sick. And healing all who are oppressed of the devil. So sickness becomes satanic or demonic oppression. It's not of God. If you go to heaven, you won't find any. It's not there. Hello. Man wasn't subject to it until the fall. Amen. And so God purposefully anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power, and the purpose behind that was to go out and to do good and to heal all. And he, who were they? He was, healing, he was healing those who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with them. So when we come to the subject of healing, being healed, receiving healing from God, receiving from heaven, we have to first of all recognize where the source of the problem is. It's not God. You know, you go blaming God for making you say, oh, Lord, I don't know why you're trying to do this to me. I don't understand why you did this to me. I don't understand why I'm sick. Oh, I wish you'd heal me. I wish you would take this off me. I wish whatever it is you're trying to teach me, you was, you, I, I would learn so I could get rid of this. Well, the truth of the matter is you're blaming the wrong party. See, if you're, if you're troubleshooting something, now, I'm, uh, I'm a, uh, I, was a, I was. I can still program, so I guess I'm still a programmer. You know, you can be a programmer and, and try to find, uh, you know, you're trying to find the problem in a computer program, but if, you, if you've determined ahead of time where the problem is, you might not ever find it. Amen? You know, you may, uh, now, back in my day, some, of course, Dick's old enough to understand this era, and Bill is. Uh, some of y'all may not have had, had any experience along that line, but back in my day, we, we, now we programmed what was referred to as the mini computers, the IBM System 3 range. That was, that was, that's what we learned on, because that's what everybody in Eastern Carolina used in all their little shops. They use IBM System 3s. And, uh, and anytime a program would bomb, you'd walk up to, they have a little dial on there, and, um, you know, it would come up with, a, oh, it had a little digital thing, and it come up with a number. Error 86. And you'd have to get the book down, and you'd have to flip through the book, and you'd find error 86. Now, you, there, there were usually one, two, or three solutions to fixing error or whatever. And I just pulled up error 86. The one you saw 95% of the time in the IBM book was solution three. Restart the system. You had to turn the three and click and just, just blow the whole thing away. Well, you didn't want to do that because you would, you, you know, you could lose whatever you're doing or whatever. But, you know, was, that usually was just you lock the system up. Then you had to get your program and start going through and trying to find out what you did wrong. But I, I, you know, when I know I did this, see, if you start out with I know I did this, you'll never find your problem. Because sometimes what you knew you did, you didn't do. Now, I'm, I'm going to use a cuss word in the programming industry, back, at least back then, nested ifs. You could, you know, you could write, you know, ifs went like this. They had if, else, end, or end ifs, so depending on what the language was, you know, end if or whatever. And you could put inside of an if end, another if end. And if you left off one of the ends, There was no, that's right. You were in an endless loop. 
It just said, they go, yin, 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 yin. Why? I wrote my plan. You didn't write a stupid person. I wasn't a stupid computer. You, could, you didn't give it because it's simply following what you told it to do and you didn't give it an out. Okay? And so you, you, can't, you couldn't approach it that way. You had to know the answer. You had, to, you, had to go, you had to go through and you had to start over. And, you had, and, and so you had to start writing. All right, here's my first if. Here's my end. And you have to number them. And you to, here's my second if. Here's my second end. Here's my third if. Here's my, and you be going through that. You might, if you've got a bunch in there, you're not, it's really not a good program to do it. But if you had a bunch in there, you might be five, six down and go, oh, there it is. Forgot to put the end there. Okay? You can't assume you knew the answer. All right? And see, when we come to God, we can't, see, so many people have assumed and just taken people's word for it that God's the reason they're sick. You'll never find your answer if you keep blaming God for it. You can't get to your answer if you're blaming God for it. And if you assume that you, I know, how do you, because grandma told me so. I loved my grandma, my Pentecostal grandma, I loved her, but she won't write a lot. You get talking to her, and she just, oh, you got to be rooted and grounded in holiness. No, 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 grandmama, it's rooted and grounded in love, is what the Bible says. You know, uh, I know what the manual says. Well, the manual is not the Bible. If the manual is your, doc, is your church manual, it's not, the, it's not the Bible. And so we've approached many times the subject of healing with assumptions That'll get you in trouble. Just like if you assume you had your program right, and it's that stupid computer. Hello? It's the dumb computer's fault. It's not working. No. You, you usually, what you end up finding out, if you're smart enough, if you work hard enough, you'll find out it was the dumb programmer. Hello? Thank you, Jerry, for that. <clears throat> Key punch air, all kinds of stuff. Amen. And because you didn't do it right, it won't work right. Now, if you approach the subject of healing with the mindset that God is your cause, he's the causer, you're going to have a hard time receiving. As a matter of fact, you're going to have an almost an impossible time receiving. Because it's hard to have faith that God's going to heal you when you believe he's the one that made you that way. And for some secret reason he's trying to teach you something that you can't figure out what it is you're supposed to learn now boy it's hard to learn the lesson when you don't know what the object is if you don't understand the object or the purpose of the lesson it's hard to, get, it's hard to learn the lesson now I was, I was telling Nathan the other day I was remembering my first, first time first day in class when I went to school to learn how to program I went to a community college, so you know, it was, it was the uh, associate's degree. And um, the teacher came in and wrote up on the board like a six or seven line program. Told us to copy it. Told us to go over and, and you know, and enter it in and, and run it. And it was just simply, it was going to print test or something. They wanted to prove to everybody in the room that, if you'll do, that the, the computer will do what it says it'll do. They just wanted to prove to you it actually did, do, it actually did work. We had people who couldn't do that. Could not copy the instructions and get it to print, and so it was the computer's fault. Hello. See, when you're babes in the things of God, if you'll just do what God said do, he'll do it. You don't even have to understand it at that point, really. There's mercy there. I had people mad because they couldn't get it to print. Well, you didn't copy it right. I mean, especially when you use the Fortran, that's the sloppiest, one of the sloppiest languages on the market. You know, and it's just real, you know, whatever, whatever, print, test, boom. Back, there you go, test. And we're all excited. I got a piece of paper that I made it, I made it, did. hallelujah. When we come to Jesus, we have to take his word for his word. Now his word says, see, and see what that instructor was going to say, take my word for it, you put this information into that computer, and this is what it's going to do. It's going to print this out, and you're going to have it. The word says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. The word says Satan was the oppressor and God's the healer. So you guys have to accept that. 
I said, you just have to accept that. Yeah, but I know so. And so. Is that nothing to see? You can't bring your experience in. Are you here? And let it supersede God's word. Hello? You know, the Bible says it's not God's not willing that any that should perish, but that all should come to the truth. But did you know that there are people who die and go to hell? Now, I know you've got people now with the, with the doctrines of inclusivism, uh, inclusivism and universalism. They're believing nobody's going to hell. Well, you're wrong. That's just error. But, you know, there are people who go to hell, and God's not willing that any should perish. In other words, his will is not that they perish, but if you don't accept his will, you don't get any of the benefits. There are people who believe that God's, God doesn't heal because they met people, or it's not always God's will, because they met people who died, or they knew people who died. So you're basing on the experience instead of what the Word says. There are people in our class when I was, when I was in school who went and tried to print the, the, the instructions, didn't enter them right, and they didn't print, so they said it didn't work. No, it works. You just didn't line up with it right. Your lack of lining up with it right doesn't make the fact that it works uh, not true. It does work. Amen. I said amen. Hallelujah. And people who come to God that same way and don't recognize that Jesus is anointed to heal the sick. Everybody say Jesus is anointed. And then he passed that anointing, he can pass that calling and that gifting on to the church. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Well, I don't believe that. Why don't you believe that? What is it that makes you some hot shot that God's word doesn't work for you? I'm a special case. I remember I met one, one lady in our church when I, early on when I first got saved. Lady, I didn't just meet her. I'd known her for, the families had known each other for decades. But I remember one day she argued me down in front of the church. I'm thinking, and by the time she got done, she was the, like the man born blind. She had Paul's thorn, and um, there was one other she was suffering like. Job, there you go. She was all three of them embodied in one person. I thought, my goodness, you're arrogant. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God to heal me. He hadn't done it yet. Well, no, you didn't line up with the word. And apparently you weren't praying the prayer of faith because the prayer of faith shall save or heal the sick. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So, Jesus was anointed by God. Everybody say, Jesus was anointed by God. Jesus. The purpose behind the anointing was to do good and to heal. Say, the purpose was to do good and to heal. And the people who were sick, say it, were oppressed of the devil. Everybody say, Amen. Glory to God. Everybody, those sick people were oppressed of the devil. Now, just, I, I wonder sometimes why we can't get it right. How do we mess it up so bad that where God's making them sick and then these preachers out here laying hands on people, ministering, healing the people are of the devil? And there's people who believe that. There are people who believe that. They'll get it in the pulpit. Say so these people lay hands on people of the devil. Really? Yeah, because God made them sick. God had a reason. Well, bless their daughter. I'm glad they went around when Jesus was ministering. They might help crucify him. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we understand that the healing anointing is, is, uh, was part of the ministry of Jesus. Went round about the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness among the people. Jesus' is, is, Jesus's ministry uh, uh, entailed a tremendous amount of signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. People came to Jesus and got healed all the time. Amen? It's part of his ministry. Well, God cares about, even under the old covenant, God made provision for health and healing. Now, they didn't get in on it most of the time. Why? If you're going to be dumb, you're going to have to be tough. 
uh, truly. If you don't trust God, if you don't believe God, if you don't look to God, amen, lepers could come to Jesus and get healed. You're talking about a scourge of the day. People would come and get healed of leprosy. Halt and wither would be made whole. Amen. The blind to see, the deaf to hear. Go tell John. The blind see, the deaf hear, and the lame are made to walk again. Hallelujah. Amen. The proof of God, his ministry was that people were getting well. Jesus is still operating in the earth today. Amen. He still works signs and wonders and confirms it. And he confirms the word with signs following. One place said they came to hear and to be healed. Amen. Jesus was ministering somewhere and they came to hear and to be healed. Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. So, Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost, with power. He went about and he did good. He healed all who were oppressed of the devil and God was with him. Now, so we, we find out here, you know, this, you know, this, this one passage could get, could get people healed all over the place. When you recognize who the problem is, the devil. Yeah. Amen. When you recognize the answer to the problem, Jesus, the word, God. Amen. And you all put it in operation. Glory to God. Now, are you here? Yeah. You can get the answers. So you can get the answers. And so I, I, I think the church needs to return to a, a, a place of humility when approaching the things of God. Even we charismatic word of faith people, Pentecostals, sometimes we just think we know everything. It's good just to step aside and say, teach me again. I remember listening to a, a series one time. Well, actually, Dad Hagen has a series called the ABCs of Faith. It's an older series. But what, how it came about was that he was, uh, he was doing some stuff, and the Lord said, go back and teach the ABCs of faith. He said, you're trying to teach people where you are, and they're not where you are. You need to go back and teach it in fundamentals. Just teach the ABCs of faith. Amen. I think we need to just keep, keep our hearts right. Stay in a place where we can learn from heaven. Recognize that Jesus is the healer. Everybody say, Jesus is the healer. Amen. And uh, walk in that place with him where we allow him to function and operate in, his, in, in, in who he is and then what he's passed on to the church and what he teaches the church. We need to learn from the head of the church. I'll tell you one of the things that we, we do so often is we think we've got it all and we don't need to listen to anybody else. We always need to learn. There's always we say somebody that can say something in a way that'll make it make something make something else make more sense to you, and you haven't arrived yet. Amen. I remember one time a few a number of years ago, probably about well, Dad was still alive, so this is at least before 20, uh, 2003. three, two thousand and three. But he he was he had been out on the road a bunch, and uh, Brother Doug Jones had been teaching his classes. Now, now Doug Jones is an excellent Bible teacher. I, I love Brother Doug, and uh, but some. Student was sitting out there, and, and, and Dad had come back in, so he was teaching the students. And this student poked somebody next to him and says, let's get rid of the old guy and bring Doug Joe's back in here. Now, let me say, say I, kn I know Brother Doug. If he had heard it, there wouldn't have been enough left of the guy to fillet. He'd have cleaned his clock in front of everybody and then re-cleaned it, and, and he, would have, he would have taken him to task on that. Dad was still teaching right until the end. He said stuff we could learn from. I, I tell people all the time, I said, I was in his Winston meeting, the last me full meeting he did in, in May of 2003. Best Bible teaching on faith I ever heard him do. There was just an anointing on it. You know, you could tell it was physically uh, diminished. He having some physical issues at that meeting. But I'm telling you, his teaching was great. Yeah. I'm sitting there going, man, this is good. I've heard him for, for uh, decades now. And I'm telling you, this is good. This is good stuff. Awesome. We don't, we don't, we don't know what's on the right. We need to keep open hearts and keep learning. Amen? And when it comes to things like the subject of healing, we don't need to think we've got it all figured out. God don't do that anymore. Why? Because uh, some old person told me they knew somebody that died. 
No, I know people who died and went to hell. Amen. I remember one time I had a, uh, we had a, I had a girl who used to come to our church years ago. And uh, she, she kind of not stay connected and got married. And, and her dad died. They, they, and they weren't going to church anywhere. And the dad didn't go to church anywhere. And, I, and so I sat down. I talked to her. I said, well, did your dad know the Lord? She said, I, I don't have any proof at all. He, he, he knew the Lord ever was think, ever had any relationship with the things of God. Da 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 da. I mean, you're kind of like you know, and I've got to do the funeral. You know, well, you don't go to the funeral when people are hurting and put the people in hell. They busted hell out of me. If you don't want to do it, get out of here and get saved. We don't have we don't have Jesus doing we don't have Jesus record Jesus going to any funeral and. And, and, and damning everybody, that, the people to hell, and they need to come follow him. We don't have any record of that. Have any record of the apostles. So, so how do you preach a funeral like that? They're in the hands of a just God. They're in the hands of a just God. They live their life, you talk about their life, and they now are in the hands of a just God. You don't have to say he's going to send them to hell. You know they are. If they didn't, if they didn't ever say Jesus, they, that's where they went. But it's the justice of God will. If they got saved with their last breath and as they were leaving their body, they said, Jesus, be my Lord, they, he would save them. He's just. He would do that. But if they didn't receive him and didn't have, any, have, have him in their life and they left this life, they're in his hands. He's just. They'll pay the penalty for their, their resistance of, of his plan. So they're in the hands of a just God. And you let people just take that however they want to take it and you go on about life. Amen? Hey, I said Amen? Hallelujah. But I'm saying, we, there are people we know that went to hell. But I don't stop preaching Jesus saves just because I know people went to hell. As a matter of fact, it should make me want to be more aggressive so that nobody goes to hell. And the same thing about healing. People who die from disease and sicknesses should make us want to be more aggressive to get the word to them that Jesus heals. So they don't have to go through that and suffer through that. Somebody say Glory. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.